hello and welcome to another it's not really a vlog it's gonna be weird because I have clips from things that I've done throughout the week that will make it into this video but this is me wrapping up the week I was away because I was not able to record my thoughts as I was on vacation because I am horrible at vlogging on my phone and privacy is not a thing when you're on a family vacation and I still don't feel comfortable video recording around other people which I'll have to get used to eventually but not today so I finished two books and started two other books while I was away I finished well so that yeah what cat the first thing I finished was the sword of Kaigen which is so good so good um I would say that similar to things like the poppy war you should check out content and trigger warnings if you um are not good with gore related to war and things like that. Um, it is a, it's a story. I mean, it says it on the cover. It's a, it's a war story. So there's, there's going to be some sadness and I'll be real. It takes a lot for a book to make me feel things. And I felt all the things I was on this emotional roller coaster the whole time. It was so good. I gave it to my mom and I had to really warn her because, uh, there's some things that happen that I know she hates in books, um, but I still wanted her to read it because it was that good. So I'm like, okay, you need to be ready for this thing. And I like straight up almost had to spoil a thing for her. So she'll be like prepared and not like hate me later, but she still really loved it. And like, this book will make you sad. It will make you laugh. It'll make you feel things there. It, you will have the spectrum of emotions while you consume this book. And it is so well written. I am so excited because the author is the same age as me which I don't think is very old. I mean, I don't know, I was born in 92, so you decide. But that just makes me so excited to see what else she's going to give us throughout the years, because it was so good. So good. Um, it's on Kindle Unlimited. You can get it that way. I think it's also like only a few bucks. I don't know. Read it. So good. <laughs> I also finished Thunderhead, which I still liked. Not as much as Sword of Kaigen, but I was buddy reading this with Laura from a book circus, and yeah, we really liked the world building expansion. Um, the ending is bananas. <laughs> like, it's a really good ending, or at least a very gripping ending, and I need to read the toll. I need to figure out what is happening next. So yeah. But while reading all of this, let's discuss what I also was doing that week, because I'm going to show you something but we also went on a few walks so maybe I will do a little voiceover or I'll cut away and you will see this walk but it was supposed to have cascade and it didn't because there's this huge drought up in New England right now uh, they have not had rain for like most of August and it showed I've never seen the water so low at the lake we go to and like I said there was like no water at this cascade but afterwards, this is like the most New Hampshire thing ever. We went to go see the boulder at, in Madison, New Hampshire. And like, yes, we went to go see this big rock. It's a huge rock. Like you're going to see right now. It's a really, really big rock. But we went to go do that. My grandpa lives in Madison, New Hampshire, so it's not a long trip. But it was one of those days where, you know, we wanted to like sort of get out, but not like get out. And the best part is there was this dog. His name's Cosmo. And Cosmo was just this golden retriever just around, rolling in the dirt, running around, saying hi to us. We thought Cosmo was with the family that we saw leaving the boulder. And then Cosmo was with us and the family was gone. And we're like, okay, is, are they going to come back for their dog? Meanwhile, Cosmo is like taking family pictures with me, being the best dog I've ever seen. I'm about to take Cosmo home. Um, <laughs> At one point, he just, like, goes into the little ravine near us, like, the little river. And it's just, like, swimming around, being a happy dog. And we, the, they were tagged, so we called the owner. And Because, luckily, my boyfriend had service there because it's New Hampshire. So having service is not a guarantee. And apparently, the owner just lives around the corner. And the dog just knows how to get home and is allowed to just wander. And if, I don't know, if you've never lived in a small town, New England area, that's just the most New Hampshire thing that's happened to me in a long time. Cosmo was great. It was a highlight of the trip for sure. It was so cute. So when I wasn't doing that, I was reading at the lakefront. So that's where I read most of Thunderhead. And I will show you the beautiful view 
oh, it was so serene to read out here. One day I had the lake to myself for a long time, which like never happens. There's normally not a bad thing, but there's normally dogs and kids around. Not too many. We were all very socially distanced. This is um, normally an event where there's like 100 or 200 people, and this year it was like 30, because the event was canceled, but you could still rent the cabins, and you just had to provide your own food, which is what I did. I stayed with my, um, I ate with my grandpa at his place, but stayed at a cabin down below, so I wouldn't, his house doesn't quite have enough space to comfortably house all of us, and so yeah, I stayed at this lake, and I'd kayak on it, and read by it, and it was great, so yeah, but Thunderhead, <clears throat> crazy ending, excited to read the next one, we'll see what happens there, and then I decided to pick up this short story anthology called Sunspot Jungle, which has such a good cover, like, so cool, um, so this has a bunch of authors on it. Some that I knew when I picked it up were Charlie, Charlie Jane Anders, Am Amal El Mortar, N.K. Jemison, Sylvia Moreno-Garcia, and it has so many others that now I need to check out their other novella or novel works because they had such cool ideas in this story. I'm now this far, but I was reading just a story or two a day. There are so many stories in here. This thing's like 500 pages, so like, it's pretty great, and it's just... It's so cool. I'm um, in my unhaul recently. I got rid of two short story anthologies that I just didn't think were that interesting, and this one is just so cool. So I'm considering buying this and the volume two, just if only for the art. Like so pretty. But so that was something I started to read, and then we went on a hike, my boyfriend and I, because I have not hiked in a long time. Well, only a year. So I try and hike a mountain once a year because I have access to that. My grandfather lives like an hour, 40 minutes, not even south of the White Mountains. So I can go visit him and then take a short drive to a trail and hike a beautiful mountain. So I should do that. And so last year I hiked Mount Shikarawa and that's a almost 4,000 footer. If you don't know, 4,000 footers are like a, not a big deal in New Hampshire, but there's like 44 of them, I think. And like, it's like a whole shirt and you try and like do all of them or something. I don't, cause I am weak. I am weak. But I still, we hiked this other one. It was South Moat Mountain. Cause my cousin, she's from Maine. And I was like, I need to know a local mountain that local, like that only locals know about that like is a medium level mountain <laughs> that will like make me feel like I've hiked, but not kill me. And she came through, it was beautiful. It was like four hours for us round trip, enough for me to feel like I exerted myself and feel like I deserve all the food and to relax the rest of the day. We had gorgeous views. I will show that here. Oh, it was beautiful. It was such a gorgeous day too. Like the whole week was gorgeous. It was beautiful weather. So we had a great time on that hike and it was just a really good time. And then while I was reading Sunspot Jungle, I decided to finally start to Ghana by Guy Gabriel K. So I have wanted to read this book since my graduated from undergrad, which I think is five years now. Goodness, because I read his Finnevar Tapestry. And he does this thing where, if you remember from my subgenres video, European fantasy, Arthurian fantasy, not like my thing. Like it's okay. It can be done really well, but in general, that idea, if you tell me that's your synopsis, that's your setup, I am bored already. Like, I don't want to. I feel like I, my instinct is that I've already read that story. It's going to be written in that writing style that's so much work. Like, I get, like, I get antsy about it. I don't want it, <laughs> essentially. Now, I don't know if there's any truth based off that. That's just my instinct. And his Finnevar Tapestry is kind of like... Narnia-ish in that you have a bunch of people from contemporary today sent to this other world who and have to deal with the magic of that other world. It's also, you know, it has authorian elements to it. And I really liked that trilogy. Like I read all of it. I bought the same edition of all of them. And then I heard forever that this is his best book. This came out in 1990. And I had been looking for it at used bookstores for a long time, but no one ever gives this book away. So it's never at the used bookstore, but it's also never for sale on the bookshelves. So back when I was buying books, I couldn't find it. So I kept not reading it. It kept being in my Goodreads want to read, um, what is it called? Purgatory. 
And then when I was started going to the library, it was always available. So then I never took it out because I like to take things out and have them on hold so they don't all come to me at once. So really this book was in a weird purgatory where like I never read it, even though I really wanted to. And then I finally pick it up. I have the Kindle and then I take out the physical, well-loved library book so that I had, you know, a reason to read it, which I really actually love how well-loved this book is. This book probably is 20 years old because it's from 99. Um, I think it's the first edition paperback too, but it's, it's so floppy and it just feels, feels really good. It's like soft. And I actually really like how the text is kind of more bold, but this all aside. And then I was nervous when I picked it up because the premise is not the premise that interests me. You know, it's this land, there was a fight with sorcerers, and now the land's name was taken away, and it's about people getting the land back. I don't know anything about the magic, etc. And then it's a 1990s book, and 1990s books and me have mixed histories. I mean, gosh, that's The Wheel of Time, that's The Witcher, that's Robin Hobb, and that's um, George R. R. Martin's start of A Song of Ice and Fire, and... I have like a 50% success rate in liking fantasy books from the 90s, mainly because of writing style and where the genre was in terms of plot structure and character work. Um, like I really like Robin Hobb. I struggle with Robert Jordan. I wish he had written The Wheel of Time, <laughs> though, because I am loving this book so much. And I was, I was, I had a rough go of it for 50 or 60 pages. I was really nervous. I was like, is this a book I've waited so long to read and I'm just going to DNF it? No, I'm obsessed. I'm, I'm, I'm in that mood of so excited to read it that I don't want to read it. <laughs> I don't know if that happens to anyone or if I'm just broken. But like, whenever I am reading it, I'm having such a good time and I keep wanting to reading it, but I don't want it. I want to be excited about reading it too, so I want to put it down. It's very weird. But that is all to say that the writing style is so good and that I'm so connected to the characters and I am invested and I am hoping this revenge arc it's not really revenge well kind of I'm just I'm excited to see what it does so even though this is like not supposed to be something I love I'm having a really great time and it just reminds me that I should just trust him he has a really great writing style and he does things in fantasy in a time when people didn't do this often like this came out in 1990 and for example gay characters should just exist in most worlds being gay is is not abnormal <laughs> that is a a normal thing to be and but most of the time if it's in a world it's done in a very i don't know it, it's done for trauma reasons especially in fantasy i think or it's just not talked about at all you just assume your entire cast is cis and straight and that's it and i'm not saying this is done perfectly it's still 1990 but being gay is very much a normal thing in this world. I'm, you know, it's like, it's, it's not abnormal. Like if characters pair off of the same gender, no one really bats an eye, which I just, that's a small part of the world building, but it just, it feels so progressive for 1990, okay? So yeah, I don't know. It's just another small thing that I have appreciated about it. And I just really want to read it now. Now I'm trying to remember if there are other clips that you're going to be seeing. Yes, so I have to play a lot of board games. This is a very weird weekly check-in. If you're new to my channel, this is not normal. <laughs> but I was on vacation, so yeah. And also next week's might not be normal because I'm moving, but I'm just trying to give you guys content just so you know, you know I'm still alive. <laughs> but I played a bunch of fun board games. We played a board game called Underwater Cities, which is where you build cities. I think I talked about this in my 500 subscribers Q&A video. It's one of my favorite board games where you build cities. So I'll show, you'll see some, some video clip here. It's really pretty. It's um, essentially you use cards and you combine it with an action to try and get resources and build things. And as you build things, you acquire points and achieve goals. And you also are just building a city, which is really fun. Um, some people have asked me if I've played Terraforming Mars, which is a game also, um, what's called an engine building game, which means you start off not being able to do a lot, but then as you acquire cards, you can do more things with the same amount of stuff or in the same amount of time. So that's like engine building, you know, you're building a system that makes you more efficient. Terraforming Mars is one of like the most popular games in board gaming for that type of game. 
and I think this is a great successor, so if you like Terraforming Mars, you should also check this out. Sorry, I became a board game channel for like a second there, but I'm not done. <laughs> I also played a game called Maracaibo. If you don't know, I'm Venezuelan. Maracaibo is the city where my family lives, so when I saw that one of my favorite board game designers made a game called Maracaibo, I needed to buy it, and so I did. Now, there are issues with the game in terms of... It's just... There are types of board games called European strategy board games, and they love to be as dry as possible in their themes. Um, but not only that, but to somehow still harken back to colonial time themes, which is like, do something else. <laughs> so it's not like the greatest historical time period for them to have chosen, but the game itself is still solid. Um, so I'll show you an image of the game board here. You have a little boat and you travel around the Caribbean to get things, to get points and it's a fun time. I, I had a, a good time with it. It's one of it is still one of the games I really like. My favorite game by that designer is Great Western Trail. It's about herding cows. <laughs> it's like the most European idea of the American like West that I've ever seen, and it's phenomenal. And I'm trying to think if I had another image. Yes, I also took a clip of Space Space, which is a game I would actually recommend to anyone who likes Settlers of Catan or Catan, whatever. It's a game where you always are getting resources even on other people's turns, so like you roll the dice, it's just two d6s, and you can either get resources based off your board off the two individual numbers or the combination, you get stuff, you try to get points to win. It's really quite straightforward and really fun, so if you like Settlers of Catan, but maybe don't like the stress of trading with people and you just want to like do the whole casual roll dice and let probability take it away, it's a really great game for that. It's really fun. So yeah, I played a bunch of board games with my mom. It was also her birthday. So yeah, I'm sure maybe I have forgotten stuff about clips that I took. Hopefully this video makes sense. Editing me is probably hating me right now. But yeah, I had a really good reading week, a really good vacation. Now I have to move. But I am enjoying the things that I'm reading. And really, that that's, that's where I'm going to let my mental health be. If you made it this far, put a mountain down below. Like if you liked it. Subscribe if you want to. And I promise if you're new, this is not a normal video. <laughs> I am normally much more put together <laughs> than this video. So yeah, I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.